I want to talk about some of the hormones that are responsible for tissue growth, responsible for muscle growth, but I also want to address some of the pressure that you might be feeling from the industry and sometimes even from your doctor when it comes down to human growth hormone or IGF. Hey, if you haven't already, I want to make sure you hit that subscribe button so you get videos every single Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time. And always make sure you check out highleat.com so you can check out the apparel that I'm wearing as well. Okay, so let's get down to the science of this. Human growth hormone and IGF are two very, very similar hormones within the body. And what I mean by that is they do very similar things, but at the same time, they're also very, very different. So what happens is your pituitary gland creates something called human growth hormone. This human growth hormone circulates throughout the course of the body and eventually hits the liver. When it hits the liver, it triggers the release of something known as IGF, insulin-like growth factor one. So the first misnomer that we have to address when we're looking at human growth hormone, we're looking at muscle growth in general, is that human growth hormone doesn't directly allow muscles to grow. Human growth hormone indirectly activates IGF, which therefore allows muscles to grow through a couple of different pathways. You see, not only do we create insulin-like growth factor in the liver, we also create it at different localized areas throughout the body in the skeletal muscle and in the bone. So that's exactly why hormonally, your body starts to build muscle when you train a specific area. So when we look at things like this, it would be easy to assume that if we utilized human growth hormone, we'd be able to produce more muscle. But let's understand how this works a little bit more. You see, human growth hormone is usually secreted through periods of growth, naturally. Okay, so whenever your body biologically feels that it needs to grow, adolescence is a perfect example, you're gonna be secreting human growth hormone in a pulsatile fashion. And you're usually secreting it throughout the evening time or through the night time when you're asleep. But you're also gonna secrete it when you're consuming copious amounts of protein at one sitting, simply because of the amino acid arginine, but you're also gonna stimulate it through intense exercise. So first off, we have to understand when the body is producing it. And that helps us understand when you would actually need it. So believe it or not, it's being discovered in a lot of studies that unless you're deficient in human growth hormone, you're not gonna get much benefit out of adding it into your body. Now we're gonna address the human growth hormone side of things a little bit more when we look at some of the studies later in this video. But first, let's talk about what IGF is and how this process works. You see, most of the anabolic responses that we're getting from human growth hormone, again, aren't a result of human growth hormone. They're a result of IGF. So let's talk about IGF. You see, IGF stands, again, for insulin-like growth factor. And what that means is it's very, very structurally similar to insulin. Now, if you've watched my other videos, you know that insulin is the absorptive hormone, okay? It's the hormone that turns your body into absorptive mode, meaning it's easier to store carbohydrates and it's easier to store fat and ultimately even easier to store a little bit of muscle too. Now, because insulin-like growth factor is a lot like insulin, it has the ability to turn muscle cells into a very, very hungry state, meaning they're able to take in protein, increase protein synthesis, and ultimately increase muscle. That's the benefit of insulin-like growth factor, and of course, its precursor being human growth hormone. So what happens is after the human growth hormone triggers the liver to produce IGF, this IGF binds to insulin-like growth factor binding protein, and it circulates throughout the body, and then it reacts with another protein that allows it to get into specific cells or cross through the blood-brain barrier to actually grow your brain as well. So it's a very complex system. It's not quite as simple as human growth hormone just immediately causing you to gain more muscle. It's a lot more complex than that. You see, some of the other ways that IGF actually allows you to boost muscle from a hormonal standpoint, from an enzymatic pathway, has to do with something known as protein kinase B, okay, AKT. This is a specific pathway that IGF triggers, and this specific pathway triggers protein synthesis. So it's doing this through a different mechanism, and it does this by eliciting a response on what is called the mammalian target of rapamycin. Maybe you've heard of mTOR before. mTOR is literally the anabolic switch. So you can have all the IGF in the world, but your muscle is not gonna grow if the mTOR switch is not flipped on. You see, mTOR equals anabolism. No mTOR equals catabolism or at least no muscle growth. So without the anabolic switch turned on, IGF doesn't necessarily grow muscle, but it can grow tumors. That's definitely not a good thing. So why do we hear so frequently from so many doctors and from so many other resources that we should be utilizing exogenous human growth hormone as we get older. I mean, it kind of makes sense at first. We're getting older, so our levels are declining, but are they truly declining and are we truly in a deficient state or are they declining at the age at which they should be declining and you're having other hormones balancing things out? 
Well, I'm going to reference a couple of studies, but at the end of the day, a lot of it is showing that it's just the lipolysis, the fat burning effect of human growth hormone and IGF, that is causing people to get a little bit confused and think that they're building muscle. When in reality, they might just be getting a little bit leaner, which of course is a good thing, but we have to look at the big equation and whether it's worth it when you look at the cost, benefit, and risk analysis. So this first study was published in the American Journal of Physiology, and it took a look at test subjects that were clearly deficient in human growth hormone. So it took a look at older women. So we're talking like 64 to 82 years old. We're talking like an older demographic of women that are severely deficient in human growth hormone. And what they did is they measured some levels after they gave them either human growth hormone or low, medium, or high doses of insulin-like growth factor. And they gave this to them every week and they measured it over the course of a period of time. And what they found at the end of the study was that yes, these women that were deficient in human growth hormone had an increase of 9% in overall protein synthesis as associated with the HGH and a 4.5% increase in protein synthesis associated with the IGF. So yes, there was an increase in protein synthesis. In fact, when they measured protein synthesis by concentration of leucine, they actually found that there was a 50% increase in protein synthesis with HGH and a 67% increase in protein synthesis with IGF. What the heck does this mean? Okay. All that this truly means is that women that were deficient saw an increase in protein synthesis. Now, these are the kind of studies that are always out there. They take these studies with people that are deficient in something, they give them an exogenous form of something, and they say, voila, look, we fixed everything. The reality is these people were deficient in something. So what we are looking at it as performance people and as people that are trying to better ourselves and get in amazing shape and stay healthy, we have to look at some of the other science that looks at it from a different perspective. So here's what's funny when we look at the other side of the equation. The same journal, American Journal of Physiology, published a study looking at healthy adults that had healthy levels, normal levels, of human growth hormone and IGF. And they gave them exogenous HGH, and they wanted to measure their overall levels of protein synthesis and what actually happened. Well, guess what? No change. The only change that occurred in those that took the exogenous HGH was a small increase in net amino acids in their forearm. Yep, they measured a few more aminos in their forearm. That was the only difference when human growth hormone levels were already at their normal state. But there was another study that was published in JAMA that took a look at this as well. And they found that again, older men that had healthy, normal levels of human growth hormone for their age saw no change in terms of muscle mass and strength when utilizing exogenous human growth hormone. But those that weight trained did see a change. So if you took those that were utilizing exogenous HGH along with weight training, yeah, they saw a change in muscle mass and strength. But those that were not utilizing HGH but also weight trained saw an increase in muscle mass and strength. So you have to ask yourself, where do you want to go with this? Now, the studies are proving that there is an increase in lipolysis, meaning a small increase in fat burning, but there are also studies that are showing there is an increase in collagen synthesis with human growth hormone. So what can be happening is people can be seeing an increase in their collagen levels, which means their connective tissue is a bit stronger, which means their muscle contractile strength is a little bit more. They can handle a little bit more. So any increases in strength could be attributed to that, but changes in physique and appearance are likely due to skin, and likely due to lipolysis, the increase in fat burning. So what we have to do is we have to look at the increase of insulin-like growth factor that occurs from exogenous HGH use and how it has an effect on tumor growth and other tissues that we don't want to grow, and we really have to weigh the pros and cons. If you're at the age where your doctor's pressuring you, is it something that you want to do? You need to do your due diligence and truly look at this, because when we look at how the body works, we truly have to capitalize on what it is doing in its own natural state at its own very point in time. So my honest, humble opinion is exercise hard until you can't exercise hard anymore. Because exercise is one of the most powerful, natural ways to stimulate human growth hormone outside of, of course, sleeping and the occasional intermittent fasting. So as always, make sure you're keeping it locked in here on my channel. I know this video wasn't one-sided, it was kind of a big overview. But if you like more on this topic and you wanna hear a little bit more about how these things work in the body, just put them down in the comment section below and we can decide on what videos to do next. I'll see you in the next one.